Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to take a look at cult safeties from the 1900 through the 1911. There's a lot of discussion that you'll often see about the 1911 safety system, the fact that it has a grip safety and the thumb safety, and a lot of people invest a lot of significance in this fact, and I don't know that they necessarily understand how that actually came to be. So let's start by going all the way back to John Browning's first semi-automatic or self-loading pistol, which was the model of 1900. It has a very interesting, unique safety system to it. It's called a sight safety pistol oftentimes, because the rear sight actually pivots up and down, and when you push it down, it snaps into a detent, and it actually, the rear sight itself acts as a lock that holds the firing pin in the rearward position. Um, and then you can drop the hammer, do whatever you want. Uh, the firing pin can't move, therefore it can't fire. That was the safety mechanism. And that worked fine. However, they abandoned that fairly quickly. Uh, and in the model of 1902, in fact some of the military contract 1900s, there was a small batch of them, a couple small batches of them purchased, uh, a bunch of those were actually retrofitted to get rid of that safety altogether. And with the 1902 pattern guns, both sporting and military, Colt had literally no safety mechanism whatsoever except for a half cock on the hammer. And what this inevitably has to lead us to is the fact that carrying a gun with a loaded chamber with the hammer down on a spring-loaded firing pin was considered a, an acceptably safe practice. The idea was as long as there was enough uh, travel in the firing pin that you could have it have the hammer flush down on the firing pin and it wouldn't protrude out the front, the idea being uh, the firing pin is shorter than the channel it's in, so under normal firing circumstances it's backed out a little bit, and when the firing pin hits it, or when the hammer hits it, it goes forward enough to fire and then rebounds back. Given a system like that, people were perfectly acceptable of you just gently lower the hammer onto the firing pin, and then presto, the gun's safe, because even if you hit the hammer it won't fire because the firing pin's not long enough. Now, in theory you could have a, an impact on the gun heavy enough that just the inertia of the firing pin would cause it to come forward, but that's acknowledged, admittedly fair, a fairly rare event to happen. You'll see this complete lack of external safety mechanisms continue on both the 1902 sporting and military guns, also the 1903 pocket hammer, which was intended to be a carry gun, uh, sort of, and also on the 1905, uh, which was the first gun to introduce 45 ACP cartridge. No safeties whatsoever. Kind of crazy by today's standards. Now the one place in these early Colt Browning pistols where you will find safeties as we would recognize them today is the 1903 Pocket Hammerless. That thing's got both a grip safety and a manual safety, and that's because there was no hammer for you to access to gently lower to the fired position or to leave at half cock. I mean the gun was called hammerless, it was actually a concealed hammer design, but you couldn't do that, that safety procedure on them, so they had to have some sort of other style of safety. And so the 1903 gets both a grip and a manual safety um, that you don't see on the guns with exposed hammers. Now when the Colt pistol gets to US military trials, uh, what we regard as the 1907 pistol trials uh, doesn't quite mesh with Colt's model numbers. Colt submitted a model of 1905, to that trial, because that's the most, you know, that's the first gun that they had in 45 Auto, with no safeties at all. And the gun is deemed one of the winners of the trial, and the government then wants to do an extended uh, field test on it, and they request a contract of 200 guns for field testing, but they want a couple of changes. And one of the changes that they specifically request is some sort of automatic safety. Um, it's worth Pointing out here, just a little separate tangent, uh, Colt did have what they called safeties built into the gun, but the, these were this was a mechanism uh, to prevent the gun from firing out of battery, which is absolutely an important thing. But it's not necessary. Like we take those as uh, we take them for granted as so obvious and necessary that we don't consider them optional, and we don't really consider them safety mechanisms. That's just how you build a pistol. Anyway, uh, Colt integrates a grip safety into the 1907 that's sent out for field trials, and very interestingly they actually omit the half cock notch on those guns. 
Also interestingly, the way the grip safety is designed, you can actually decock the gun with one hand, and that carries all the way through to the 1911. If you pull the hammer all the way back, it actually hits the beaver tail of the gun and depresses the grip safety for you. The government requesting that safety makes sense even if you continue to assume that hammered down on a loaded chamber is an acceptable safe condition for the gun, because these trials were being done entirely by the cavalry. The cavalry are of course riding around with the thing in one hand, and if they drop it, without a grip safety you have a, a significant chance of dropping it on the hammer from the height of a guy on a horse, uh, and having the hammer snap forward and fire the gun. That was a problem that definitely needed to be considered, and that's why they wanted a grip safety on it. Uh, if you consider the trials reports from guns from the 1900 all the way through the 1907, and even beyond, one of the big complaints that cavalry troopers had was uh, that you had to use two hands to get the first shot off, which indicates that they were generally carrying the gun's chamber empty. However, you always have to consider what happens if you fire a couple shots and then you're left left with the gun partially loaded. How do you reholster that thing safely? Um, and originally, in 1907, the grip safety was considered sufficient for that. You decock the thing and back in the holster it goes. We don't even we don't see the grip sa or the thumb safety added to what would become the 1911 until virtually the very end of trials. Uh, the 1909 has a bigger grip safety that's a little easier to engage, which is nice, it's pretty close to what you'd get on the final model. The model of 1910 carries over just having a grip safety, uh, but now with the, the sloped grip that we'll recognize from a 1911. And it was only in the 1910 trials that someone kind of as a side note went, you know, we kind of might want to have an extra safety, so it's it's a little safer when you're riding around with a thing in the holster if you don't have it decocked. You can you don't have to decock it. You can engage a thumb safety, holster the gun, and be safe. And that is the genesis of of the thumb safety on the 1911. It is the requirement for the cavalry to be able to safely reholster the gun one-handed while it's hot. I think that's a pretty interesting story, and I think it's a little bit of background that a lot of people don't realize on where the 1911 actually got its grip safety. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.